there's, there's three things that I was going to talk, at, talk about in terms of uh, this reading. And, yeah, it, it goes into real depth here. I think, having reflected on this uh, over the past week, there's nothing more than, I suppose, I think, a, a guidance on the, the very meaning of life and faith. I think it, it's, it's that amazing and important. Talking about it for a few minutes and reading it won't get it, but I think it's a doorway for anyone to go and explore what the depths of faith can actually, uh, or what God invites us to go on. First off, we've got the, the question that we considered earlier on today, of who is Jesus? Who do people say I am? And yes, this... Uh, a couple of times, and you, and you see even back then, there was people who had all sorts of different ideas about who he was. <coughs> yeah. John the Baptist, or the Sir Largers, and still others, uh, some of the prophets. And Peter says, you are the Messiah. It's interesting there, just in those few words, you've got four different understandings of who Jesus was there and then. Those were the people that were with him. And it is, it's about that, firstly, that understanding about perhaps who Jesus is. And as we've already looked at today, I think a reflection of our own journey, who we are, and that's important to what I'll talk about uh, in a moment or two. But it's always got who, who here, I've mentioned this before, but who here likes the, uh, the programme Who Do You Think You Are? Where a celebrity goes. Yeah, we've seen, seen a, a fair few of those. Um, and. Yeah, there was two out of, I mean, they've been doing it for many years, but yeah, there was the, the very famous one where the comedian Alexander Armstrong, uh, who, who knew he was posh and, and came from a sort of a good heritage, but he didn't realise it was that good in terms of that it was related back to kings and all the way back to William the Conqueror. There was a bloodline straight back to the person who created modern Britain, effectively, who were the reasons why we're sort of Anglo-Saxon and everything that came on. Um, and that would have very much informed him yeah, I, I, that's it. It's that thing why family history, um, people like doing it. Don't we? we often have that at our computer class. People will come in wanting to do... You, you, you've been a bit of an expert with it, haven't you, Carol, in terms of helping people, because you've looked into it. And it's something about our own identity, about filling in some gaps, perhaps why we are the way we are and where we are. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? I also really like the, the Brian Blessed one. Uh, as well, that was last year. Uh, Brian Blessed is larger than life as it, possible, but it, he was really taken with his great great grandfather, who was, a, a, you know, he built up a really good business in Lincolnshire, and unheard of at the time, he had 13 children, all of which survived to adulthood. In the sort of, uh, in sort of early Victorian times, that, that just didn't happen. Um, and that said, he was there at, at his great great grandfather's grave. Um, very emotional about it. Um, and, and that's it, it's that question of identity for us um, and also yeah, yeah, for Jesus. And I think this is this first, first of my three, if you like, of these things of how we go on in our own faith. Firstly, you have to decide who, who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? It's interesting who um, Jesus uh, says he is, okay? I think we have to mention that because it's, it's a peculiar thing we find in the Gospels, okay? Did anybody, it's on the screen, but uh, anybody just want to, did anybody spot it? What Jesus always refers to himself as? Son of mine. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> doesn't say son of God, does it? It says son of man. And I will tell you that, uh, yes, there's been many a book written, a lot of ink spilt over what that means and why he said it. And of course there's no consensus. There are certain things you can look at as to why he said it. Firstly is that if you actually go back to your Old Testament, it's used hundreds of times. Okay. Where it got, starts to get tricky is that when it gets translated to Greek or to a Greek-speaking world, it wouldn't have meant anything to them. It would have almost just been three random words that people would have gone, well, what does that mean? Maybe, if he said it in Aramaic or Hebrew at the time, the Jewish people around it would have seen it as a sign. Because if they'd known where clearly it's used in the Old Testament, they would have understood it. 
But in, when it's sort of translated into Greek, it becomes not the son of man, but almost the man's son, what some people have identified. But it's, it's an interesting thing that Jesus only ever refers to himself as that. Nobody ever else calls him that. There's only one exception where a crowd asks him, why do you call yourself the son of man? Okay, so it's a peculiar thing there. Ben Adam, as it is in Hebrew. We've been talking this morning about Jesus as role model, um, as somebody that we try and follow, and there's certainly elements of that within this reading here. One of the things that um, Jesus is in, interested in is listening. I don't know whether you've, you've spotted this here. He's asking the questions, and then he's listening to the answers, and then he's asking again. And I think that's always it's perhaps one of the most underused gifts by a lot of people, myself included at times, that... Um, that the, gifts, uh, the gift of listening is very good. We were given, I think, the senses in proportion, that we've got two ears and one mouth, and uh, we should use them appropriately. And sadly, most, an awful lot of people don't, especially when you're having a, perhaps a heated or an interested conversation. You want to get, you get your next word in without thinking or stopping. But Jesus is here, he's interested, isn't he? He's, uh, he's asking the questions, listening, and then responding. Uh, to that. He seems a bit harsh on Peter um, when he goes on to uh, the next bit, talking about what would happen to him. Perhaps he was asking him in some way, in quite a harsh way, to trust him. To see beyond, perhaps, your initial reaction. Which is what Peter did. He took him aside and started began to rebuke him. I don't know, and that's a different thing. For different people it means different things, doesn't it? When you've rebuked someone, it's not really a word we sort of use very much, but clearly correcting him, telling him off, telling him not to be stupid, whatever, whatever that means to you. Um, but Jesus, yeah, it says something quite harsh to him, really, but maybe it's just to get him to move on from his thoughts. And then we start to get to the really interesting stuff. Okay, so uh, we've got that first bit of us uh, as people today, thinking about who Jesus is, who, who is he to us personally. And then we've got that bit, which we've already mentioned today, where he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Okay, now a lot, of, one way of understanding that has been that it's about, yeah, sometimes being a Christian is hard, hard work. Uh, most people here could probably put their hand up and say that if you've been Christian for any length of time, um, sometimes the demands of that, either for themselves uh, or within family, has been quite hard. And we have to spare a moment, a moment's thought and prayer, really, for all the refugees, uh, particularly from Syria, of which there will be. It's not been something which, of course, the news doesn't um, go into any great detail, but many hundreds, thousands of those will be persecuted Christians trying to escape just because of the persecution um, and trying to escape and give some sort of uh, life uh, to their family. And I think it is right to, to remember that um, and that Jesus, um, well, saying what it's like really, to take up your cross is a hard thing. It's using the metaphor of being carrying that cross for being horrible and difficult sometimes. But we do have to think of that. But perhaps a, an alternative way of, of looking at this um, is related to what, what goes on to next. Is that we've got to make that decision to want to, to walk with Jesus. Because when we get on to the, the third bit, which it's really hard work. It's hard to understand what he's talking about here. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Yeah, that's quite a challenge, isn't it? And then we go on to, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This way it starts to get really quite challenging. And it's that whole thought of, we know who we are, we build a life having some sort of identity, thinking about who we are, and then at some point Jesus says, I 
want you to just trust me. And that can be quite a hard thing to do. What we see in Paul's writing is Paul really sort of understanding that and, and taking that forward. I'll just give you some uh, Philippians 3.8. It is far more than that. I consider everything else worthless because I am much better off knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. It's because of him that I think of everything as worthless. I threw it all away in order to gain Christ. That's a quite a challenging one, isn't it? If you read it in one way, because he seems to say, well, everything else is worthless. But I think it's, it's one of those things where we have to get past that initial reaction of actually saying, I know that I am here because of God's gift and grace. It's about not putting emphasis on anything else, because those things will pass away. We will pass away. All this, this building will go one day. All those things, if we put our worship in anything other than God, other than the gift that God's given, it's when we will come unstuck. Because, as it says there in Acts 17, 20, for in him we live and move and have our being. And interesting, in that bit, for those that come on a Thursday morning, that's bit where uh, Paul is talking to the people in Athens, and he's trying to tell them about God for the first time. They had never heard of him at all. So a bit related to what we're looking at. And then Ephesians 4, 6, One God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. And then Philippians 2, 17, Paul says, But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. This is a sort of a deep invitation into what faith is about. I came across um, an interesting extract from a book that I'm reading at the moment related to this. So this is an extract here, which I think explains it a little bit further. So this is from John of Landsberg, and he was a 16th century Catholic monk. Okay? And he wrote what's seen as a classic, A Letter from Jesus Christ. And he imagined Jesus speaking personally to us. And this is the extract. I know those moods when you sit there utterly alone, pining, eaten up with unhappiness, in a pure state of grief. You don't move towards me, but desperately imagine that everything you have ever done has been utterly lost and forgotten. This near despair and self-pity are actually a form of pride. What you think was a state of absolute security from which you've fallen was really trusting too much in your own strength and ability. What really ails you is that things haven't simply happened as you expected and wanted. In fact, I don't want you to rely on your own strength and abilities and plans but to distrust them and to distrust yourself and to trust me and no one and nothing else. As long as you rely entirely on yourself, you are bound to come to grief. You still have a most important lesson to learn. Your own strength will no more help you to stand upright than propping yourself on a broken reed. You must not despair of me. You may hope and trust in me absolutely. My mercy is infinite. Okay. Quite difficult, quite difficult to get your head around some of these this thought. But for me, this is and this is something that I've been looking at and reflecting on for an awful long time. So I was pleased that this sort of came up. This uh, and I know from personal experience, trying to understand what is being asked of us here is really quite difficult. Um, but that's that's good because one of the things you never want to do is get stale in your faith and think, well, I've sort of got that. I know Jesus. I know what it's all. I know what my faith's about. Um, Faith is about yeah, making some sort of commitment to Jesus. Faith is about doing something about your faith. Taking up your cross and following Jesus is sometimes about, yeah, I'm prepared to take on some of the difficulty that comes with that, but I want to live it out. It's like following the free set or, or anything else that we do here. And then there's that invitation to think, I'm actually just going to trust God completely and let God lead and guide my life knowing that it is only through his gift and grace that I'm here at all. And then all of a sudden you get into sort of a, a deeper engagement with perhaps what God wants to do in and through us. It's challenging stuff. But I'm going to leave it there for today. But if anybody wants to talk to me about this at any time, please come and say it, because as I said at the beginning, it's not something I can cover in sort of 15, 20 minutes and then leave you with it. Let me finish with this prayer. 
Lord, I think I know who you are, though sometimes I wonder. Pinning you down is not easy. I think I know who I am, then something makes me wonder. I put my foot in it. I am clumsy. I cause pain. Help me to know you better, Lord, that in knowing you, I may find my true self, the person you would have me to be. Amen. Amen.